Good evening. Every single year, millions of people around the world get excited for upcoming video game releases. This has been happening for decades now, for as long as video games have been a thing. And if you're watching this, then I'm sure there's at least one video game release you can remember getting hyped for. Back in the day, launch dates for games like Halo 2 had passionate fans literally setting up camp tents outside of GameStop buildings overnight just to be among the first to play them. But how far would you be willing to go to get your hands on a new game? Would you be willing to camp outside a game store? Would you be willing to illegally pirate it using shady software? And if the game you wanted to play wasn't released or even finished yet, would you be willing to hijack the internal server network of the company working on it just so you could illegally download a copy for yourself? To most people, that last part might seem a little bit over the line. But back in 2003, one little German boy didn't think so. And his actions are responsible for birthing one of the most prolific video game mythos and one of the longest running, most dedicated gaming communities on the entire internet. Today, I'm going to explain why people are so fascinated by the Half-Life 2 beta. Now, what is the Half-Life 2 beta? Well, as you probably know, the term beta is used to refer to an early build of a game that isn't quite finished yet. It's not uncommon for people to be drawn to these early versions of games, as they're usually very familiar looking, but just different enough to be interesting. Duke Nukem Forever is a great example of a game with a community that's honestly more passionate about what's not in the game than what is. However, in the peculiar case of Half-Life 2, the word beta is actually used as somewhat of an umbrella term that doesn't refer to any one specific early version of the game, but rather pretty much any content that didn't make it into the final release. And that's because the scope and direction of Half-Life 2 changed so much over its six-year development cycle that earlier versions of the game are pretty much unrecognizable from what we got in the end. Different characters, different weapons, different locations, different stories. The game changed a lot, and the only reason we even really know as much is because of an event so intensely damaging to the game's developers that it might as well have been an act of industrial espionage. See, the story accompanying the Half-Life 2 beta is honestly one of the craziest and most memorable tales in PC gaming history. Allow me to give you the rundown. The year is 2003. It's been five years since the release of the original Half-Life, and the yet-to-release Half-Life 2 is quickly becoming one of the most highly anticipated video game sequels of all time. Axel Gembe, a young German hacker, wants to play it really, really badly. So using his tech skills, he illegally infiltrates Valve's internal servers and begins downloading files off of them. He ends up making off with not only an unfinished build of Half-Life 2, but also pretty much every single map, model, and asset ever created for it, its source code, and even files related to other games Valve was working on at the time, like Team Fortress 2 and Counter-Strike Source. Now, Axel was a huge fan of Valve and never intended to hurt them with his hack. He was just desperate to learn more about their upcoming games, even if it meant getting invasive. But Axel did share some of these files he acquired with a few close friends of his. And then some of those friends presumably shared them with their friends. And inevitably, an early build of Half-Life 2 and all of its accompanying source code wound up leaking online to the public on October 4th, 2003. Panic. This was a flaming catastrophe for Valve. Half-Life 2 was set to be their biggest product yet, and was the game they were relying on doing well to keep their doors open. Not only was this massive, humiliating leak obviously a disaster for their employees' morale, but it also exposed that Valve had been pretty much lying to the public about how ready the game was. Valve had previously scheduled Half-Life 2 to release that year, and this leak made it obvious to everyone that there was literally no way that was going to happen given how rough of a state it was in. Half-Life 2's already crunched developers were now forced to rush their game out even harder than before, as the company bled what's estimated to have been over a quarter billion dollars in estimated damages, and the greater public began to question their integrity. This whole fiasco nearly sunk the entire company. In the background of all this madness, Valve CEO Gabe Newell had of course linked up with US law enforcement and began desperately searching for the man responsible, going as far as to publicly reach out to online Half-Life forums to ask the community for help. However, this never amounted to anything. And as time passed, it started to really seem like nobody online knew who was responsible for the original hack. After five long months, all of their leads had gone cold, and it was beginning to look like the man behind this cybercrime was never going to face justice. But by this point, Axel Gembe, the true culprit, had been watching one of his favorite game companies get thrust into turmoil over a leak he had inadvertently caused, feeling conflicted, guilty, and no doubt nervous knowing that the FBI was onto him. So what does he decide to do? Well, he directly emails Gabe Newell, of course, Axel personally apologized to Gabe for everything that had happened, explained that his true motivation was just being a huge fan of the company and that the leak was a complete accident. And then to round things off, he took this opportunity to ask Gabe for a job at the company. Yeah. After months and months of fruitless searching, 
The man Val had been looking for basically brought himself to their doorstep. They arranged a phone interview with Axel, and then told him he was officially invited to visit Valve's headquarters for a second in-person interview. However, as you might have guessed, this interview was actually nothing more than a ploy to bring Axel to America so that the FBI could promptly arrest him. Before that could happen though, Axel was arrested in his hometown of Schönau im Schwarzwald, Germany in May 2004. And despite how much damage his actions had caused, the judge in his case pitied him for his young age, troubled childhood, clear remorse, as well as the fact that he wasn't actually the one who posted the files online, and he was let off with a remarkably lenient sentence of no jail time and just two years probation. Half-Life 2, the finished version, was later released in November 2004 to critical acclaim, and through helping launch Steam, played an enormous part in turning Valve into who we know them as today, the only billion dollar game company that doesn't make any games. Gabe Newell became a billionaire, stopped wearing John Lennon glasses, and by now has even lost an admirable amount of the weight the PC gaming community once ridiculed him for. And yet, despite how much time has passed, how Valve as a community has moved on, and how the gaming world at large has changed, the Half-Life 2 beta leak still continues to captivate millions of people to this very day. In fact, it's even inspired what some people might call copycat crimes. More on those later. Anyway, now that we know the story of how it all went down, you're probably wondering just what's so interesting about the contents of the Half-Life 2 beta that would make someone willing to risk prison time over it. Well... As we touched on earlier, Half-Life 2 had a uniquely complex and turbulent development cycle that the 2003 leak gives us a lot of great insight into. And since Half-Life 2 is the game that gave birth to Gary's mod and brought us pretty much every other massively famous game that runs on the Source engine, knowing how it evolved into what it is today adds interesting context to a lot of popular internet culture. Like, it's really strange to know that the creepy priest guy that millions of people have seen in famous Gmod videos at one point looked like this. Probably the first thing worth mentioning about the Half-Life 2 beta is how the game's story changed. Although the game's plot was always going to end with the human forces triumphing against their alien oppressors, the early storyboards for the game were much more hopeless and darker. In the Half-Life 2 that we got, City 17 is basically a giant prison camp with sprinkles of futuristic technology. But in earlier drafts, it was an all-out industrial dystopia powered by child slave labor, with the outdoors smothered in a toxic green smog that forced the population to wear gas masks all the time. All of this is the basis for one of the most ubiquitous and longest-running memes in the community, the mantra that the Half-Life 2 beta was dark and gritty. However, while this green, nasty, foggy version of City 17 is one of the more recognizable cut and revised locations, it is far from the only one. For example, the reason the city was swamped in so much green fog in the first place was because of the air exchange facility, which was this enormous atmospheric reprocessor bleeding the earth dry of its resources and terraforming it for alien life. Although it was never quite finished, this cut chapter is damn near fully playable in the 2003 leak, and it has some really interesting Halo 2 kind of vibes that I've always enjoyed. There was also going to be a section of the game set in the Arctic and on an icebreaker ship called the Hyperborea. This idea was eventually reused in the Half-Life 2 episodes to bring us the mythical Borealis ship, an endgame time machine that Half-Life 3 was almost certainly going to revolve around. See what I mean about how it's interesting to see how this stuff evolved? There's also the desolate wasteland ruled by the Antlion King, which was scaled back to just the Highway Coast segment in the final game. This train depot near Nova Prospect you were originally supposed to explore. An underwater research facility called Kraken Base, which eventually evolved into Black Mesa East in the final game. And tons of other strange and nifty lost locations like the ever-beautiful Ravenholm docks. And in addition to all these cool lost maps, the beta leak also shows us many interesting monsters and characters that didn't make the final cut. One of the most well-known is the Hydra, a giant electrified water tentacle that was prominently featured in some of the game's promotional material. Although the developers all agreed that it looked really cool, they eventually decided that it wasn't very fun to fight, and felt too much like a rerun of the tentacle boss from Half-Life 1. In fact, making Half-Life 2's enemy roster more unique from the original games seems to have been a big point of focus for the team, since they also cut this combine female assassin, the Hound Eye, and a couple of heavy combine units that somewhat resembled the old Zen aliens. The Cremator is another example of a famous cut monster. He was supposed to be this weird, imposing combine janitor who would burn dead bodies and aliens to ash in the streets. The developers loved him so much that even after they cut him, they stuffed his head model into a jar in Kleiner's lab, leaving it ambiguous as to whether they still exist in the final game's continuity. It's actually pretty crazy how many different enemies Valve came up with for this game, and how few of them made the final cut. This Metrocop Elite and this Bull Squid were apparently both still in the game by the start of 2004, which is kind of crazy to think about. In terms of actual human companions, my personal favorite cut character is the Hyperborea ship engineer Odell. 
His face may have been reused for Odessa, but I still find him and the scenes he starred in very memorable on their own. Hey, here's a thought. I've got a cigarette lighter, you've got a gun. Maybe you should go first. There's Captain Vance, the leader of a cut faction called the Conscripts, who was later merged with Eli Maxwell to create Eli Vance. There's the earlier version of Dr. Breen called the Consul, who comes across a lot more cold than 1984-esque, and whose propaganda about how the true citizen behaves are yet another example of a popular beta meme. There's this early version of Dr. Kleiner, who was cut after an awkward encounter in an elevator. I talk more about that in this video. And finally, there's Alex Vance, whose original skin-tight jumpsuit design was weirdly sexier than the one we got in the final game. Sorry, but someone had to say it. Mysterious, aren't you? Before we move on, I do also have to mention the cut weapons found in the beta leak, especially the fizz gun. Just like the Hydra, this thing was prominently shown off in one of the game's E3 presentations, and when the game launched without it, a lot of people were super disappointed. Modding the fizz gun back into the game was one of the first things the Half-Life community did once it came out. And that's actually the backstory of how we wound up with Gary's mod, believe it or not. Gordon's firearm arsenal was at one point going to be a lot bigger too, probably because they once planned for the player to be able to switch out weapons and lose their inventory at various points in the game. One of the most beloved cut guns is the OICW, which got replaced with the AR-2 in the final game. But there was also an AK-47, this hideous looking unfinished LMG, this combine sniper rifle, an MP5K and an MP7, a giant plasma cannon, a flamethrower, flare guns, molotovs, and a fire extinguisher. Just generally a lot of crazy stuff that it's interesting to imagine fitting into the final game. Anyway, even outside that absurd amount of lost content and the crazy story behind the leak itself, there's a few other key factors that I think also play a big part in fueling people's undying love for the Half-Life 2 beta. One of them is Valve's reputation. If there's one thing this company is known for that isn't convincing people to spend thousands of dollars on virtual gun paint and hats, it's the fact that they pretty much always deliver unforgettable video games. This gives them a uniquely loyal, diehard fan base, and that, accompanied by the fact that their output is so ungodly slow, makes any and all content from them a hot commodity that people literally fiend over. There are many cases in which people in the community have spoiled business relationships with Valve and breached legally binding contracts with them, risking jail time just to leak more beta content onto the internet. It's pretty crazy. The most recent and notable example of this is that Valve Giga leak that happened a few months ago, where a guy on Discord literally leaked almost all of Valve's internal repositories from 2017, unleashing almost every map, model, and texture ever created for Team Fortress 2. And this is far from the only leak to have happened since Half-Life 2 released. It's sad because, while the public getting their hands on content like this is cool, it's also seriously straining Valve's relationship with its community. This all helps bring a sort of true crime feeling to the beta culture, and I'm not really sure how to feel about it. But moving on, I'd say probably the second thing about the beta that captivates people, and probably motivates all these desperate leakers, is just how mysterious this cut content can be. The Half-Life 2 leak is something Valve generally avoids talking about or addressing publicly, which makes some of the bewildering stuff that can be found in the beta feel even more strange and unexplainable. This bizarre Hazard 01 map brings the player into a training course, then has them escape the bounds of the level and get scolded by the G-Man. Get back where you belong and forget about all this. One of the cut City 17 maps has this flickering room with a weird, creepy clock mechanism in it that no one seems to have ever come up with an explanation for. <laughs> And there's even some people in the community who claim that the cut sound file Trans 6 includes audio of the last moments of a female Soviet astronaut who died in space. Though I'm pretty sure this is just a myth. There's also some stuff in the beta that isn't necessarily creepy, but is definitely bizarre, particularly in relation to G-Man for some reason. This map called Icky Pop features him getting carried away by a crow. This RT camera demonstration map shows a G-Man Breen hybrid standing next to a bunch of children. And there's even a notoriously goofy G-Man sighting in Ravenholm that was cut. Now's also probably a good time to mention what I think might be the longest running Half-Life 2 beta meme of all time, free TVs. There's a Half-Life 2 level from the year 2000, which is Lost Media, that apparently showed civilians in City 17 beginning the uprising revolution by breaking into stores yelling, get your free TVs. It's really a shame we probably won't ever get our hands on this map, given how highly coveted and silly it is. It's like a gag from the Simpsons or something. One of the things that I think goes hand in hand with that mystery appeal to the beta is what I guess you could call the deception element or something like that. 
As I mentioned earlier, the leak showed the public that the game wasn't ready yet. But looking deeper, it also demonstrates that a couple of the things Valve advertised about the game were deceptive or even flat out lies. The Half-Life 2 E3 presentations that Valve gave were a lot more heavily scripted than they were letting on. A lot of the maps they showed off weren't anywhere near complete. And thanks to the leak, we can see that if the guy hosting the presentation would have moved just a little too far in the wrong direction, he would have completely broken the illusions of these levels. And I can't help but notice that even the final game's marketing material includes a ton of outdated images and arguably false advertising. Now, I don't have a very big collection of Half-Life 2 stuff, but even I have a copy of the game that I can easily spot cut material on the case of. Like, this beach with an antlion guard and a gunship doesn't appear in the final game, nor does this area with all these cut gas mask citizens running around. This picture shows Eli in Kleiner's lab for some reason, and I'm pretty sure all three of the front cover arts for the game have cut levels transposed in the background of the characters. Hell, even to this day, the Steam page for Half-Life 2 still has cut content in its screenshot gallery. It's as if Valve didn't even care to clean this stuff up at all. And that, I think, is probably the final and maybe even most important reason that people continue to stick around and obsess over the Half-Life 2 beta. For the community of people who continue to spot these quirks about the game, and who have a shared love for the story behind them. Beta content continues to inspire tons of really cool and interesting fan projects and remakes, and it's brought a surprising amount of people together over the years. There's a remarkable amount of passion and love that's been put into bringing Valve's cut ideas to life in these projects, and it's difficult to not feel at least a little intrigued seeing these enemies and locations stitched back together, allowing us to fully appreciate material that was once almost lost. Not all of it is totally constructive though, I must admit. Discussion about cut content does have a habit of sometimes drowning out other topics in the Half-Life community, and there's a small minority of people who do seem to view the beta like it's just a secret finished game that Valve intentionally downgraded for no reason, of course ignoring the reality of game development and failing to appreciate the hard work that went into creating the final product. But at the end of the day, that's just how it works when you have a cool interesting thing on the internet. People are always going to pervert it and be annoying. There's no denying that the story behind the leaks and the beta as well as the mystery around its mythos, are fascinating and easy to get lost in. And it's interesting to think about how many other games might have had crazy development cycles like Half-Life 2's, but that we don't know about because the developers were more tight-lipped and never suffered a crazy disastrous leak. Just like myself, the Half-Life 2 leak turned 20 years old this year, and yet it somehow seems like we're still learning new things about this game and its development on the regular. Everyone knows that it's hard for a video game to amass a cult following, even a really good one. Thousands of video games are produced every single year, with the vast majority of them going completely unnoticed by the general public. So I would say that it is truly remarkable that this unfinished, uncompiled disaster of a leaked build from two decades ago continues to inspire and captivate people to this very day. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed and learned something. I've been Ricky Blober, subscribe to my channel for more epic videos, and have a good day. I've made a mess of things without you here, oh yeah! Can't hold